Hello all, welcome. My name is Phoebe Myers and I'm the Community Program Senior Manager at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. We are so excited to welcome you to our fifth and final Naturalist Night series presentation this winter. The Naturalist Nights is a free speaker series that is uh, in the Roaring Fork Valley and is a partnership between the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, Roaring Fork Audubon and Wilderness Workshop. And this year's Naturalist Night series included five presentations and all of those will be available online on our websites for you to watch at future dates um, or if you missed a few um, as well as ones in Spanish. Um, and we would also really like to thank our tonight's sponsors here on the screen. Uh, these uh, businesses provide financial and in-kind donations to help make these presentations possible. But it is such a joy for me and privilege to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Phil Hagera. Phil is uh, the associate professor at the University of Montana, where he directs the paleoecology and fire ecology lab and teaches courses in fire and ecology and disturbance ecology. Uh, research in his lab spans Western North America and has re revealed how fire activity varies with climate change and in recent decades and in pa the distant past and how forest ecosystems have responded to these big changes. It is so wonderful to welcome Phil back to ACES as he was a naturalist in the summer of 1999. Um, and right after that, he headed to grad school at the University of Washington. And since 2006, varying components of his research have focused on fire history and ecolo ecological change in Colorado forests in the Rocky Mountain National Park and beyond. And so it is so uh, such a privilege to invite Phil to the screen. Um, and welcome him here tonight. Hi, Phil. <laughs> um, I think hey, that, I'm yep, here you. we are. Excellent, your audio is working great. And Phil, where are you tuning in from tonight? I'm tuning in from my office at the University of Montana up in Missoula, Montana. Wonderful. And we have people rolling in right now. We have about 50, 50 people coming in and more and more coming. And um, it seems like we have a few people um, tuning in from kind of all over. Um, and we please let us know. Also, this is just really fun for us to know where people are tuning in from. Anyhow, I'm going, you sound great, you look great, and uh, I am going to hand it over to you, Phil, and thanks everyone for joining tonight. Thank you very much, Phoebe, uh, for the introduction, and, and thank you, Jim and ACES, for the invitation. It's really, it's a great pleasure to be able to, to participate in, in Naturalist Nights and return to the ACES community, if, if only virtually. I uh, wish it could be there, all of us at, at Hallam Lake, but I'll take this as a small perk of, of the uh, virtual world that we've been living in. So as, as Phoebe said in the introduction, you know, since, since I was a naturalist at ACES, but basically since then, I've been studying fire ecology and fire history across the West in Alaska, the Pacific Northwest, and across the Rockies in Colorado and up here in the Northern Rockies. So I'm particularly excited tonight to be able to link up some of this work and provide some context for the way we can understand not only the 2020 fire season in Colorado, but the challenges that we're increasingly facing living with wildfire in the West. So as, as Phoebe said, or you know, I, I told Phoebe, I'm coming to you from Missoula, uh, Montana, and here's I'm in my office here at the University of Montana, looking out at the slopes here of Mount Sentinel as the sun is moving up there as the sun sets. So I'm up here and like, like much of the West, like much of Colorado, you know, I am, Missoula is, is in a landscape that burns frequently and has burned frequently in the past. So the, the presentation tonight is gonna kind of combine both my professional and research experience and perspective, along with the perspective of somebody who lives in and, and loves these landscapes as many of you tuning in tonight do. Uh, in, in, in our neck of the woods, our last big regional fire year was 2017. And this photo in the background is the Lolo Peak fire, which was just south of town. So I know many of you who live in Colorado, I see in the chat here, a lot of people from Colorado, right? You just went through one of these years and, um, you know, 
increasingly we are, have a number of questions about what's going on, what can we expect in the future, and tonight I, uh, I hope to, to be able to answer and address some of those questions. So I'm, you know, I'm in the business of studying fire and uh, responding to media requests and just making sense of things myself when we have these extensive fire seasons. But 2020 to me was, it was different. Uh, maybe because we were in a pandemic, but 2020, watching the 2020 fire season unfold, it really hit me that the predictions that myself and colleagues have been making for decades now about increased fire activity as climate warms um, are, are really being seen. So if there's a take home message of my whole, of my whole talk tonight, it's that the 2020 fire season in Colorado really exemplifies what it looks like for ecosystems and our human communities to adjust to a warming world. You know, uh, one of the uh, one of the extraordinary fires that burned in Colorado this year was this East Troublesome fire, and uh, one of the extraordinary components here is this was all in October. So I'm going to start tonight uh, by focusing in on the present, you know, the what and why of the 2020 fire season, mainly in Colorado, but we'll put this in the context of the West. And then we'll go back in time and put this in the context of the past. And then we'll finish by uh, hopefully thinking about what we expect in the future and what we can do. So the East Troublesome fire was one fire that already after an extraordinary fire season in the West in October, uh, grew extremely rapidly. In less than two days, it exceeded the, the previous record holder in the state. And probably most dramatically, I think, it, as many of you know, it jumped the Continental Divide in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is really just extraordinary. Um, a week earlier than this, there was the, the Calwood fire also burning in, in October that you know, sent many people evacuating. It burned homes and was threatening my, my brother and sister who would live, live in Boulder. Uh, so a lot of a lot of things happening and even from afar it was pretty it was pretty dramatic. So let's jump in then and and put the 2020 fire season kind of sum up some key things here. This is what it looked like just from the perspective of fire extent. So this isn't the most important metric but it's the one that we can easily measure. So here's the East Troublesome fire Cameron Peak fire, the fire on the title slide, which is now your state record holder for fire size. And up in Wyoming, the Mullen fire burned into Colorado. These three fires in, in themselves here really encompass a lot of burning in a small area. And later in the talk, this is the region that we're going to be zooming into where colleagues of mine and I have really a, a unique set of fire history records that help us evaluate and put this into context. And then hiding over here, the Pine Gulch fire, all three of these right, broke the size record, the previous record holder from the early 2000s, the Heyman fire. So I've said in, in, in earlier talks, the 2020 fire season, it was really, it was a record setting, record setting fire season because records were set multiple times. So here are those fires we were just zooming into in Northern Colorado and Wyoming. This is what was going on across the Western coast, Washington, Oregon, and California. So I don't want to belabor the point, but California had five of the state's six largest fires occur in 2020, record setting fires in Oregon and Eastern Washington. So altogether, really the Northern Rockies were the only region last year that didn't have an unusually active fire season. So those are some of the stats and, you know, Increasingly, what is clear about recent fire seasons and 2020 included is that they're having unprecedented impacts on, on humans. Uh, so as, as an ecologist, I'm in increasingly seeing that, you know, what we know about fire, it's, it is increasingly worried, worrisome to me, not for the ecological impacts of fire, but the impacts it's having, uh, wildfires are having on human communities. So if only for the exposure to hazardous air quality, to millions of people in urban centers, you know, up and down the West Coast who don't live in fire prone landscapes themselves. Uh, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, uh, and people along the Front Range who are more used to it, right? That has important health impacts. 
Over 10,000 structures were damaged or destroyed in the 2020 fire season and dozens of lives were lost, including in Colorado. So as these fire seasons unfold, undoubtedly, we want to know why, you know, what is the cause? And of course, with, without going into the media too much, right, there's all sorts of things out there. But um, in, in September, I was invited to write a letter to an editor with my colleague here, John Abotsoglu. So this was all done before the East Troublesome Fire and some crazy fire growth in, in Colorado in October. But the, the title here is really the overarching reason why fire seasons like 2020 are possible. And that's because we had record setting climate conditions across much of the West. And in particular, what I'm showing you here is, is a jargon term that I don't expect to be familiar to people, vapor pressure deficit. This is basically a measure of how thirsty the atmosphere is. And the higher the vapor pressure deficit, the more the atmosphere sucks water out of soils, out of live vegetation and out of dead vegetation. And it's this record setting vapor pressure deficit across much of the West, including Colorado, that enables extensive fire growth. It makes it very easy for fires to ignite. And once they ignite, they can spread rapidly. And that's of course what you need to get these these large fire sizes. 2020 also is kind of an explanation point on a trend of increasing fire activity across the West over the past several decades. This is the red bars here, the area burned in the lower 48 Western US. Here's where 2020 sat at the end of September. So it's a little bit higher now. And like, uh, like 2020 itself, right? the total area burned across the West is well correlated with this vapor pressure deficit. So in some sense, what was, what I've said to people is if, if, you know, if we were running a lab experiment, the results from 2020 would be great because they fit right in with our understanding of how climate, here's this vapor pressure deficit relates to total area burned. 2020 fits right in there up here. Um, but of course, this is an experiment that we're all living through and uh, it, it's coming with, with uh, increasingly impactful uh, consequences on humans. So 2020 was part of a larger trend. And importantly, we now know over the last several years from important work that part of this increase in fire activity is directly attributable to human caused climate change. And it's about 50%. So about half of this increase in area burned is because of anthropogenic warming and the impact that has on, on fuel aridity, how dry fuels get. The other half is, you know, we are, would be there anyways due to natural climate variability. So climate change is definitely part of the, of the story here. As we zoom in to Colorado, Colorado fits this same pattern. Right? So, here, this is a, an eco-region, an area of similar ecological characteristics, the Central Rockies. Here are those three fires we were looking at earlier. Within this area since 1984, there's also been an increase in, in area burned. And this is a log scale here, so I'm throwing a little curveball there. But 2020, 43% of the total area burned in this region occurred in 2020. So that's a pretty extraordinary. And note that just five years, since 1984 account for about 90% of the total area burned. That's the way fire works. We have most years where there's not a lot of activity and then every few years we have really extensive burning. Note also that the time gaps between these years is getting shorter. So we're seeing this more often, both in Colorado and across the West. So I've emphasized climate here and uh, you know this used to be like 10 slides coming up. I've just jammed it into one here. I'd be remiss not to note that, you know, of course, there are other factors that are in play here, but climate is really the overarching thing that sets up and enables these years with extensive burning. Across the West, you know, over a century of, of policies that have either limited indigenous fire use or uh, focused on fire suppression have, have changed the vegetation and species composition in a lot of forests, particularly particularly lower elevation and mid elevation forests that burn frequently in the past. Humans, in addition to our impact through climate change, like we have our hands all over fire. Um, we do a great job of putting out fires. We put out 98% of the wildfires that ignite. 
but nonetheless, the 2% that escape uh, initial or secondary efforts, those account for 95% of the area burned. And uh, that statistic has been largely set like that for over 100 years. So even with technological changes, that's, that's fairly set. And of course, you know, we are increasingly living in the line of fire as a, a paper from some CU Boulder uh, colleagues said from last fall. It's increasingly clear that we kind of have two um, worlds going on. We have fire in, in wild areas like wilderness areas, national parks, that in many ways it's behaving like it has in the past. But then we also have fire in the wildland urban interface and areas close where we build that are the fires that catch get the news. So in for better or for worse, we start the fires that have direct impacts on our homes and cause evacuations, the majority of them, over 90%. Okay, so that's, that's my caveat on the non-climatic factors and um, or my, my nuances. And we can save the rest for, for any questions at the end. At this point, what I'd like to do is transition now and start to think about fires of 2020 and, and burning in the 21st century in the context of the distant past. So I'm going to start really big picture and just remind ourselves, right, that fire is not new, right? It's not unique to the 21st century or the 20th century. Right? Fire is a long-standing natural process that's been part of our planet for 420 million years, basically, ever since we've had vegetation on, on the land and enough oxygen in the atmosphere to sustain burning. Humans have evolved in the presence of fire, as has uh, many organisms and ecosystems, right? We've used fire for 50,000 years to change landscapes. So in the one sense, fire is this wholly natural phenomenon. And in this sense, I am including humans here. We have interacted with, we've used fire as a tool to, to modify landscapes and to serve our ends for thousands of years. So our, our relationship in the modern day is really the exception here. On the other end of the spectrum here, it's when fire burns into our communities and threatens our lives and livelihoods that it becomes a human disaster. And so this dichotomy is a little simplified, right? But um, what it reminds us of is that we really need to hold both of these as we go through and think about what's happening and what it means to live in fire prone landscapes. We can neither say that all fires should be allowed to burn because they're natural phenomena, right? That would result in a lot of bad things for humans. And on the other hand, we can't treat fire simply as a natural disaster that we should eliminate at all costs, right? We've tried that for over a century and it doesn't work. And um, additionally, there are a lot of benefits that we stand to, to get from having fire on the landscape in the ways that, that are useful to us. All right, so let's zoom in now to Colorado eventually, the Rocky Mountains. The, the 2020 fire season in Colorado and those, those major fire events in Northern Colorado happened to fall in this area that colleagues of mine are, are studying in this project that we call the Big Burns Project. And we're contrasting these two regions in the Rockies, the Northern Rockies near me in Missoula and the Central Rockies up in Northern Colorado. And the project is motivated in part by the record setting fires that the Northern Rockies experienced in 1910 called the Big Burn. Many of you have maybe seen or read popular books about this. And in essence, we wanted to understand what the precedence of these really extreme events have been in the past and how ecosystems respond. It turns out that you know, we're now able to do that in the Southern Rockies given the fire history records that we have developed in this region. So I'm going to walk you through uh, first how we reconstruct what's happened in the past. So we'll do a little bit of methods and learn about some of the, the neat tools that we use. And then we'll learn more about the fire and forest history in, in this region. So now we are zooming in to subalpine forest specifically. And you know, everything that follows from here would be different if we were talking about low elevation forests along the front range, for example. So just a reminder, subalpine forests, right? These are the highest elevation forests just below tree line. In Colorado, they're dominated, right, by Engelmann spruce, subalpine fir, lodgepole pine. And 
in particular, what, what we use to reconstruct environmental history in these landscapes are lake sediment records. So this is Odessa Lake in the center of this photo here in Rocky Mountain National Park. And it's one of the lakes where we've developed a history of vegetation and, and fire over the last 6,000 years. Lake sediments are these cool passive recorders of environmental change. And the, the way that they, they do this is by collecting stuff that lands on the water surface, like pollen from the vegetation that grows in this area, um, tree needles that fall in the lake. This stuff gets waterlogged and then it gets deposited at the bottom of the lake along with the other organic matter that's created in the lake and that comes in otherwise. And because there's little or no oxygen at the bottom of the lake, this material doesn't degrade. So it's actually really fascinating. We can go to a lake sediment record and pull out a needle like this that's a couple thousand years old and you can identify it in much the same way that you would identify a needle that you pick up off the forest floor on your hike. Likewise, pollen has particular characteristics that are associated with these different tree species. So we use those to reconstruct forest vegetation and we can tell, for example, how long this area has been dominated by spruce and fir. We also use charcoal to reconstruct when fires burned, for example, in this watershed. When fires burn here, a lot of that gets dumped onto the lake surface and that gets preserved likewise with this other material and a whole bunch of other stuff too. So you can find a scientist that focuses in on almost every, every little thing that, that is collected by these lakes. Collecting these records is, it's a lot of fun. It's done all manually. We collect the mud a meter at a time. Neither of these photos are from Rocky Mountain National Park, but often we hike to the lakes in, in Rocky Mountain National Park. We use horse packers. Sometimes we fly. This is a photo from the Brooks Range in Alaska. We collect the top meter of sediment in these clear polycarbonate tubes. And this is a, a cool example to just show uh, I'm amazed at actually how this works, even though I've been doing this for decades. This lake, we're coring, you know, the, the bottom of the lake is about 50 feet below our raft here. We're using these zirconium rods that are a meter and a half long, connecting them together, going down, measuring lake depth. And this is the transition from the bottom of the lake water to the top of the mud. And you can see we've collect that, collected that cleanly. The other thing I'm highlighting here is this layer, which you can see perhaps a little gray layer, that is ash from the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And this is in northern, uh, northern Montana, so we don't get these ash layers in Colorado, but this gives you an example of how lakes record past events. In this region as well, at, at further down in this core, we have a big slug of ash here from the eruption of Mount Mazama. And if you're not familiar with Mount Mazama, Maybe you are familiar with Crater Lake, which is you know, the national park in Oregon. Mount Mazama was the precursor to Crater Lake and it erupted creating Crater Lake about 7,700 years ago. And that plume collapsed over Northern Idaho and Western Montana. So lakes all around the region, you can, you can uh, find Mazama ash. Here is some Mazama ash from Orcas Island from my master's work. Uh, and again, just kind of nothing to do with fire, but a cool way that how, how lakes record what's gone on in the past. So we collect lake, two lake sediment cores from the center of these lakes. We uh, overlap them and we can kind of match up patterns between these to get a continuous record pack back in time. And this will go as old as the lake is. This stuff involves a lot of lab work. So like a lot of science, there's a lot of tedious lab work here, um, mostly done by graduate students and undergraduates. But in the lab, we slice this up. This is Kira Wolf, a PhD candidate in the lab. She's slicing this core in half centimeter increments. And each one of those half centimeters is kind of as a snapshot into the past, representing somewhere between five and say 20 years. In each one of those slices, we can look at the charcoal and pollen and needles to reconstruct fire and vegetation history. We use radiocarbon dating to learn how old selected depths are, and then we can create this relationship between depth in the sediment record and age in the past. And then we create time series of charcoal and, and things like pollen. So 
that's a little bit about the methods. Now, what I will invite you to do is to come on a virtual journey with me to, to Chicory Lake, which is um, a beloved lake in the, the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park. That is, yeah, one of my favorite records that I've worked with over my career. And here you can see a bunch of uh, dorky scientists in a cold rainy day in September, um, learning about the fire history that you're about to learn from Chicory Lake. So when the East Troublesome Fire made that big run last fall and jumped the Continental Divide, it burned within a mile of Chicory Lake here. And as I watched this unfold from afar, I thought for sure that Chicory Lake was gonna burn. And what you'll see here is this, uh, I don't know, Chicory Lake got lucky. It's, it's overdue for fire. So we're gonna dip in here and look specifically at the fire history of Chicory Lake. And we're gonna start with the more recent fire history, which uh, Jason Seibold and Tom Veblen of CU Boulder back in the mid 2000s learned through tree rings. So that's one way we can reconstruct fire back, but only as old as these trees are. So these are lodgepole pine that dominate around Chicory Lake. And these date to a stand replacing fire in 1782. And you can see so a fire scars on many of these to a low, low intensity surface fire from 1872. Now we can go back further in time by looking at the charcoal record here. And now we're looking at the past a little bit over 4,000 years. This, these bars are the charcoal accumulation rate and the red dots are these peaks that are statistically higher than what we'd expect uh, when, in the absence of fire. And just for reference, this peak is that 1782 fire reconstructed with tree rings. So at Chicory Lake, we can see that fire and high severity fire, stand replacing fire has been a consistent part of this lake over its past. And further, we can look at the timing between these events and we see that on average, Chicory Lake has experienced a fire every 125 years. So the 238 years since the last fire is definitely on the long end here. It's not the longest, some of these gaps are about 300 years, but you know, when Chicory burns, it will, it will be time. I'm, I'm still amazed that it, that it escaped 2020. We can also look at forest vegetation around Chicory Lake and uh, through the lens of pollen. So I'll just focus on pine pollen here. Each one of these is a different taxa. This is pollen from lodgepole pine, spruce and fir. This is, doesn't have a one-to-one -one relationship to the abundance of trees, but basically what this shows us is that the forests around Chicory Lake have been dominated by subalpine forests, uh, in particular lodgepole pine. And you can also see that that most recent fire, that 1782 fire, created a little dip in there and the forest has, has recovered. So in essence, what the Chicory Lake record tells us is that you know, forests around Chicory Lake have been resilient to repeated high severity fire for millennia. We've developed similar types of records across the park and we see basically a, a similar story at the big picture. At higher elevations, fire is a little less frequent. So the mean time between fires is, is 300 years. It's a little bit longer. But overall, many of our ecosystems exhibit this really remarkable resilience to wildfire. And this term resilience, I know it has a lot of uses in, the, in popular language. From the ecological perspective, it refers to the ability of a ecosystem to return to a condition similar to what it was like before a fire. And this term historical range of variability, it really reflects the, the different timing that we saw in, in fires at Chicory Lake, for example, and the different levels of pollen that we saw. So broadly, many ecosystems are, even though they experience what look like dramatic fire events to us, they're pretty tough and they return back to the place where they were before over time. So what is it that helps make these ecosystems so resilient? Well, part of it is that large wildfires, they burn with this really spatially variable severity. So despite what we see in the media or here, you know, often we hear that fire 
has destroyed X acres. This is a TV image from a, a local TV station where the background, the fire perimeter here is just a fireplace, it makes you think that the entire area is totally nuked. You know, in reality, what we see is that the impacts of fires vary a lot. And it's that spatial variability that allows forest ecosystems to recover. This is interesting. This is the, a, a soil burn severity map from the East Troublesome Fire. Basically, the orange colors are higher severity, so meaning more soil consumption, maybe bare ground. But the, the hopeful thing here is that there's a lot of green and yellow where there's little or to moderate burning of surface fuels. So again, largely this suggests that in, in a lot of areas here, we should see regeneration occurring, hopefully like it has done for, for thousands of years. You know, Yellowstone National Park and the fires in 1988 are also another great example of this resilience. So here's the image of Yellowstone after the 88 fires where the brown areas are the extensive burning in the park. And about 20 years later, you know, you can see many of these areas are, are recovering or on their way to recovery. So I encourage you, if you live in some of the areas close to these 2020 fires, go out there next year and walk around, check it out when it's safe to do so. And I suspect that you might be surprised at how quickly life comes back. You'll see seedlings immediately, particularly lodgepole pine. Those are the trees many people know that have these serotonous cones that don't open up until they're heated up by fire. So lodgepole pine will be regenerating prolifically. You'll see areas dominated by, by fireweed for years and decades to come here. But, you know, there's always a but. So, this resilience, this long-standing resilience to wildfire is increasingly becoming compromised. Right? And it's been widely predicted that as climate changes, our, our forests and our other ecosystems are going to move outside of the historical range of variability, ultimately but potentially crossing you know, a critical transition point where forests can no longer recover or species composition is different. And that is something that we're increasingly uh, concerned about, and we're starting to see evidence of that across, across the West. When 2020 unfolded down here uh, in, in the Central Rockies, my colleague Brian Schumann and I asked this question, well, is, are we seeing this now? Is 2020 this critical threshold? Are we seeing unprecedented fire activity? And we drew on work from his previous graduate student, John Calder, and work that I was sharing from Rocky Mountain National Park to take a look at this. And so uh, what I'd like to do here is walk you through this long-term context of fire history in subalpine forest across this region of Northern Colorado and Wyoming. So each one of these dots is a lake sediment record where we've done that really detailed work. And each one of these um, lines here is one of the lakes. So here's Chicory Lake. And now the black circles are when fires occurred there in the past. And what we see, and we knew some of this before from previous work in this region in the park range, is that during this period in the past, the medieval climate anomaly about 1200 years ago, when northern hemisphere temperatures were about 0.3 degrees Celsius above the 20th century average. So they were warmer than most of the 20th century, but we're exceeding them now. In response to that warming in the past, we saw the most extensive burning we, of any 100 year time period across this network. So we can represent that here just as the percent of sites burned. So this is that peak during this warm period. And translated into, into this metric fire rotation period, don't need to know the details. This basically reflects how often we'd expect fire to occur at one spot. The historical range of variability across this region in subalpine forests is somewhere between having a fire every once every 200 to 270 years if we pool all those records. So we were really interested in seeing, well, what is the current uh, fire rotation period now in the 21st century? And really, to my surprise, what we found is that the 21st century is kicking this area outside of the historical range of variability. This is the, the fire rotation period now, 112 years 
basically means we're burning about twice the rate at what these forests have experienced in the past. And if we zoom in just in the last decade, it's even more extreme. This kind of red area is what we expect the, the rest of the 21st century to end up in, somewhere in here. So Rocky Mountain subalpine forests are now appear to be burning more than any time in past millennia. And that is something that has been predicted, but it's kind of happening earlier than we thought. We kind of thought this would unfold mid-century. So the impacts of climate change are kind of upon us uh, more sooner than we thought. Some of these forests will be transformed, uh, no doubt. So some will recover, but some will be transformed. And we saw that happen in some areas in response to this peak and burning in the medieval climate anomaly. And the other implication of this is that our expectation of how often fire occurs in areas like Grand County, right, that needs to change. Right? It's much more flammable now than it has been both in the, in the recent past and the more distant past. Okay, so I'm coming towards the end here and I'm gonna take do a little time check. Um, I'm gonna spend the last five minutes here uh, talking a little bit about what we can expect in the future. And I'm, I'm gonna go quickly through this and maybe we can return to some of this during Q and A. And this is, probably won't come as a surprise, right? Uh, evidence strongly suggests that there's more fire in our future. Uh, a variety of future climate projections all suggest that this, these metrics or measures of aridity are going to increase both you know, throughout the 21st century. So in general, we expect to experience more years like 2020 or 2020 plus. Those same climate conditions that make wildfires conducive, warm, dry atmospheric conditions also are going to make it harder for trees and other vegetation to recover after wildfires. So we also expect lower climate suitability for tree regeneration. So we'll have areas with no or slower regeneration, lower forest density, and changing species composition in areas. And we're seeing that in some areas across the West, particularly in lower elevation forests. Now, from the societal perspective, there's, there's a whole lot to unpack in here. So I'm also jamming a bunch in here, um, which you could return to later, perhaps. Uh, what should we do? We need to plan for more wildfire. And I uh, encourage you to, there's a lot of stuff to read on this. Uh, here are a couple of key bullet points. The solutions or the way we address living with wildfire differs in different areas. So, you know, what you hear working in California or in the front range doesn't necessarily work in Grand County, et cetera. So approaches need to differ based on human exposure, the novelty of the fire regime and the historical role that fires played in the system. We need to recognize that fire is a useful tool and allow fire to burn under conditions where it's safe to do so. We need to plan for and expect change. So change is gonna be happening kind of with or without us on board. So we can either be passive reactors or active uh, planners. And then finally, we need to recognize, right, that a lot of the challenges here have nothing to do with our understanding of fire ecology and all to do with our understanding of, of the social science behind, behind this. So land managers are starting to, to um, recognize that change is happening and they're starting to shift their perspective from just focusing on returning a system to what it was before to understanding that in some areas they're gonna to have to accept change and in some areas they can direct that change. That's a challenging uh, position to move into. I'm gonna skip this last slide and wrap up. We can come back to that in questions. So what causes fire seasons like 2020? Well, warm, dry seasonal climate conditions make these things possible. 2020 fits this pattern to a T. Human caused climate change is part of the story here is increasing fire danger across ecosystems where there's vegetation to burn. Is this unprecedented? Some yes, some no, right? So wildfire has been a longstanding process across these ecosystems and the remarkable resilience that they exhibit, that will probably come through in a lot of areas that burned in 2020, 
But this resilience is becoming increasingly compromised. And I highlighted in particular that it looks like subalpine forests in northern Colorado are now burning more than twice the rate that they've experienced on average over past millennia. And that's pretty staggering. What can we expect and what can we do? We need to expect and plan for the inevitability of wildfire, address the causes uh, of, of human fire disasters, expect fire and climate change to transform our system. So we're not gonna be able to return to the places that we've loved for our lives and expect them to be the same. And ultimately we're gonna to need to prioritize among these systems where we can resist change, accept change or transform. So with that, I, I'd like to thank my sponsors. A lot of this work was funded by the National Science Foundation and, um, and the University of Montana. And you know, science is a team sport. So I've got some people listed down there that are just a few among the many who've helped it develop this body of knowledge. So with that, I hope we have some time for questions. And I, yeah, I look forward to, to having a little discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. That was amazing. I look forward to looking at those graphs and all the charts a little bit more and diving deep into that data. Wow. Um, if We would love to hear from you if you have questions. So please put those in the Q&A box as well. Um, and as questions start coming in, um, there was just a few, a little a question about if 2020 data was coming um, in some of the graphs it said to come. Was that because the paper published you were using um, it was referenced maybe to a few of your earlier slides. It said 2020 data coming. And they were just question about if. Oh, I think I did mention that uh, the 2020, the 2020 data only went through September. Mm -hmm. So there's a chunk of the 2020 fire season that's still not represented in there, like the East Troublesome fire. So in general, it's not going to change the story much. Um, 2020 is going to end up either at least number two in that in those records I've shown it since 1984 or potentially number one but I think I'll probably end up number two wonderful there's a question from Rosemary uh, she thanked you for an excellent talk and then uh, asked are there cascading effects of pest beetle affected forests yeah yeah so that that is one of those one of those other additional things that I that I didn't mention um, in previous, some iterations, I, I, I mentioned that, right? The East Troublesome Fire is a great example of that, right? That fire burned through areas that were with, with a high mortality from mountain pine beetle in, in the last decade or so. Um, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Uh, and it kind of, the answer or the way that we think about it depends on scale. So undoubtedly the, the increase dead trees in, in the East Troublesome fire changed the way that that fire behaved. And it may be part of what allowed it to spread so rapidly. But in on the other side of the equation, there are, there's the really high winds that were occurring at that time and the record setting low fuel moistures. So well, the mountain pine beetle outbreak likely changed the way that fire behaved. Uh, I don't think we can explain the entire event or the 2020 fire season for sure based on mountain pine beetle outbreaks. There has been work done, you know, zooming out and looking at the West. The increase in fire activity that we see across the West it, it is not really attributable to increased of bark beetle outbreaks. Um, it's, it's most directly related to this increase in fire conducive climate conditions. But the smaller you get, you know, the more the things like past disturbances are like mountain pine beetle are gonna be important particularly if you're a firefighter, right? You know fire is gonna behave differently. Wonderful, thank you. Um, question from Ken. In thinking about transitions to new stable states, where do Aspen forests fit in? Given their growth strategy, are they expected to dominate in the future post-fire? And do you see evidence they have become dominant post-fire at times in the past? Oh, what a great question. And that we, we actually have a project down near Paonia that is, is looking at this a little bit. So um, broadly, yes, species like aspen could be some of the species that 
that are winners in a world with more frequent fire, provided that conditions, provided there's enough moisture to allow them to grow. Um, and that's something that we would expect to see then more dominance of aspen. And interesting, you asked the second part of the question because there, there are some areas, uh, yeah, near near Aspen over the over the way um, near Paonia, that are dominated or they have a lot more deciduous vegetation on the landscape than other regions. And we're looking at a lake sediment record right now to try to understand if that was catalyzed by widespread fire in the recent past, uh, several centuries ago. So. I don't have ex examples directly from Colorado, but that type of landscape change is something that we do see in the past being catalyzed by fire. And meaning fire happen helps that transition happen more rapidly than it would otherwise without fire. So interesting. Here's a question from Scott. Is there a chance climate change could result long-term in warmer but wetter years in the Colorado Rockies? If so, how would that affect wildfires? Yeah, um, I guess I wouldn't say there's no chance, but most climate uh, projections suggest that, uh, that our summers are gonna become warmer and drier. There is some, like, I don't know if, if you guys, you picked up that map that I showed really quickly there's some areas in the Southwest that are affected by the monsoon and Colorado, you're right in that range where there could be more monsoonal moisture in the future in a, in a warmer world. Um, but when you do that trade off between increased temperature and an increased precipitation, most models are suggesting that our, that our forest ecosystems are going to experience an overall um, greater water deficit, a greater, greater thirst for water. There is a question um, about, I'll read it. Um, do you have any data going back to the last glacial period? If so, what does it show about forest growth and resiliency? Oh, that's a great question too. Uh, so all, all my work in Colorado just goes back 6,000 years, but colleagues have work that go back, uh, yeah, to when basically glaciers receded from these high alpine areas or subalpine areas um, at the end of the last glacial, so 12,000-ish years ago. And I've done work like that up in Alaska. That's where I've done my, the longest term work. And over those timescales, what we've learned from the paleo record is we see how large-scale changes in, in Earth's climate, in that case due to changes in our relationship between uh, with the sun, so orbital parameters, Part of what puts us into into glacials in the first place we see that as climate warms after the last glacial we see broad scale changes in forest ecosystems so for example um, tree line would be lower in the past and we see tree line go up in colorado over the last um, you know say from six to ten thousand years ago so we can see these broad scale changes in vegetation that occur with broad scale changes in climate we don't see that as much, you know, as we zoom in towards present, we see that less and less with the exception of the experiment we're running now in the 21st century. There is a follow-up question to the Aspen tree um, question by Nicole. And it is what other species or landscapes ecosystem processes are winners in a world with more frequent fires? Is my video on still? Yeah, okay. Lodgepole pine uh, will potentially be a winner because of its serotonous cones, uh, at, least to, at least to an extent. If, if fires don't become, if the gap between fires is long enough so that they can develop their cones, which happens relatively quickly, you know, decades, lodgepole pine will, will be a winner. And then broadly, the other types of species that will be winners are any species that can re-sprout. So similar to aspen, um, shrubby vegetation that can re-sprout, survive fire by being underground and not being totally killed, uh, that can re-sprout and come back quickly. And we see some of this in, uh, in like in California and Southern Oregon where 
shrub density is, increases after areas that have burned a couple times within a short time period. So the, the flip side of that is if you have to reseed from a long distance, like an Engelmann spruce or a subalpine fir, that's that's when you're you're worst off if you have to start from a seed from a long distance. There is a question about can sediment accumulation patterns in lake sediments reveal any correlation between historic fires and increased erosion? Yeah, they can actually. And in Chicory Lake, Chicory Lake has shows that relationship pretty well. Um, so I didn't go into these details, obviously, but we see increases in um, we have we have this metric magnetic susceptibility. It's basically how much mineral matter is in the sediment. And we see peaks in that after many of those fires that occurred. And we use that to further kind of refine our definition of a high severity fire. So we know that there was a fire in the watershed and it led to erosion afterwards. What, there's the, um, I have a question. <laughs> um, what is, something that maybe you have found as an aha or um, in your research or something that you might not have anticipated uh, that has been something that you've really enjoyed learning? Um, I think to, you know, yeah, what's fun is when you're surprised, right? And you get surprised a lot, particularly as you go along in your career, you think you figured out what's, what's going on. Um, so, two ahas. I mean, one of them is this, what I just shared with you, that, that we're so far out of the range of historical range of variability over the last several millennia. Typically in my work, what we see is that stuff that we see today is not that uncommon relative to the past. So the ahas have been two times where we've seen evidence to the contrary. One is, you know, after 2020, and then did work in the north slope of the Brooks Range in Alaska where they experienced a, a big wildfire. It was the biggest fire in the state in 2007, which was really unusual to be in tundra. And we use these methods to be able to show that that event was unprecedented in 7,000 years. Like that area hadn't burned like that in 7,000 years. And that was really surprising too. Um, we have a question about since fire is a natural process, how is it determined to, how is it determined to, how to fight the fire and how much to let it burn? The fire in Yellowstone was, some, was by some said that it was, that it was needed and that where the firefighting process was needed. Yeah, I think I think I got that question. Um, that's a great question, and it's really it uh, really broadly different land management agencies have different missions. And so, for example, the Park Service and the Forest Service managing wilderness areas. Part of their mission is to manage for natural processes. So when they can, they you know they don't let it burn. They keep a very close eye on it, but they don't put out fires. And Wilderness areas up here in the Northern Rockies are some of the great examples of areas that have been doing that since the 70s, as are national parks like Sequoia. Um, that is, is less common if you're not in a wilderness area. And, and of course, the closer you are to, to values at risk, you know, the more the decision is to just jump on the fire and put it out. But surprisingly, it, it ends up that there are a lot of values of risk out there that you wouldn't even in places where you wouldn't think that's the case. So that's in part why we end up attempting to suppress nine, you know, all fires, most of the majority of fires. Awesome, we're gonna do two more questions. I have one from Grayson. Uh, this one is, can paleo fire records help suggest the arrival of different peoples to the Rocky Mountain region in terms of shifting anthropogenic fire regimes? Um, kind of. Uh, in, you know, interpreting past human impacts on fire activity, it's tricky. I mean, we know that humans were using fire um, in the past. So 
those fire history records integrate that kind of like today we think that 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 those impacts were were greater at lower elevation there are some really good examples in specific regions where paleo fire ecologists have teamed up with um, archaeologists and anthropologists to study areas where we know humans were and yeah there are cases where you can see clear human signals where there's more fire than you than you see in other areas that don't have a history of human occupation. Um, but it's, uh, it's, there's some work like that, but it's pretty challenging, right? Because we don't, all we know is that a fire occurred in the past. So it really involves those, uh, requires those collaborations. Awesome, and this is a question from Joyce. She also is thanking you for your presentation tonight. Um, can you chime in on the latest perspectives of integrating controlled burns and allowing fires to burn in our forests and when they're near developed areas? Oh, it was going to be a straightforward question until the end there. Um, well, I'll say one thing. One thing that we have learned in recent decades is that uh, in, in these wilderness areas where fires have, have burned more extensively than other areas, we can see very distinctly the, the real impact that old fires have on the progression of current fires. And in fact, you'll see that if you look at the Cameron Peak fire, like a lot of the edge of that is going up against some recent fires in, in time. So broadly, we know that if we can allow fires to burn under not crazy conditions, that they're gonna have a benefit for us in the future terms of being able to stop fires under more ex extreme conditions. There's a lot of nuance in there, um, but that's part of the impact of, of never allowing fire to, to burn. You lose that benefit. In general, right, the closer we are to human to human housing and, and human infrastructure, the harder it is to allow wildfires to burn. Those are great areas to do prescribed fire, where fire is added to the landscape under a specific um, prescriptions of, of uh, environmental conditions. Thank you so much, Phil, for the wonderful presentation and Q&A. And thank you all for joining us on this Thursday evening and for our Naturalist Night series. It's been such a wonderful way to virtually come together and learn throughout this winter season. And again, all of our presentations will be recorded and on our websites uh, within the next few days to be able to dive a little deeper. But thank you so much, Phil, for joining us and thank you all. We wish you the best 2021 spring. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Phoebe. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everybody.